Hello, everybody. God bless everybody in Jesus' name. I'm going to do a reading by Wynne Worley called How Demons Operate. Let's start. The question always arises, how do you know if a person is demonized? Those who question persons engaged in deliverance work often ask, how can I know if I have a demon? We must not underestimate the enemy or think that he necessarily seeks to produce gross or crude behavior. He may indeed do that, but it's not always the case. An evil spirit does not always appear as an ugly and repulsive habit, characteristic, or trait. It has been said that demons burrow like termites into our lives until they ultimately bring about rot and weakness. Their work is hidden, but their effects are serious and ultimately devastating. The enemy does his very best work when he is able to accomplish his purposes secretly, buried deep in the personality and often under religious guises. Dr. Zoller states that demons are persons above all else and differ just as persons on earth do. They have traits, preferences, likes, dislikes, and they seek out persons with similar tendencies and when they enter they immediately burrow into the deep recesses of the personality and attempt to disguise themselves to convince the person and others who know him that the traits and attitudes and actions they promote are in reality coming from the person himself and not from them. <clears throat> Demons know immediately whether you are a born again believer or whether you are not. They know those who have a head belief. They know those whose names are written in God's book of life and who have the seal of God on their foreheads. They know what suggestions to, to evil you will accept and which you will reject, and they act accordingly. A demon cannot ordinarily enter your body until you open the way for him to do so, except in the event of physical, mental, or psychological shock, or in cases where demons have gained a foothold in a family line and are able to per perpetuate their work in the next generation. Jesse Penn Lewis writes that believers are open to attack by evil spirits because they have, in most cases, unwittingly fulfilled the conditions upon which evil spirits work. Such attacks are the outcome of yielding to the sins of the flesh or any sin which gives the evil spirits a hold in the fallen nature. Because their knowledge of the devil's character and methods of working is limited and circumscribed, many true children of God only recognize temptation when the nature of the thing presented is visibly evil and according to their limited knowledge of evil. So they do not recognize the tempter and his temptations when they come under the guise of natural or physical or lawful and apparent, quote, good. Because the thoughts of God's people are governed by ignorance and limited knowledge, they call the works of God of the devil and the works of the devil of God and they are not taught the need of learning to discern the difference between the unclean and the clean nor how to decide for themselves what is of God or what is of the devil. Neither do all believers know that they have a choice between good and good i.e. between the lesser and, and the greater good and the devil often entangles them there. Robert Peterson points out that the method of deception is varied to suit the special circumstances of the victim. But whatever plan is used, Satan and his emissaries persevere until the end is achieved and the deceived become ensnared. Defeat for the satanic powers comes only when the believer recognizes the peril and is on guard against it. Put on the whole armor of God, so that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. All Christians are anxious that their walk with the Lord be buttressed with experiences that will serve to verify the facts of the scriptures. The gift of, of the discernment of spirits is very necessary, lest the devil begin to give us religious experiences which counterfeit the real thing. Only by the word of God can these things be evaluated, not by piecemeal proof text approach, but rather by seeking the whole counsel of the scriptures. Trust the Lord for understanding and plunge into God's word, but if you come up with singular and radical new revelations and insights that are foreign to the people who have led you to the Lord and have nurtured you spiritually, you will do well to take a wait-and-see attitude. 
develop a day-by-day -day study of the Bible, and remember that the Lord Jesus never coerces or forces. But gently leads. He is never harsh or curt with the trusting believer, but is loving and patient. In the same vein, Robert Frost writes, The Lord impressed us to be careful in our pursuit of signs, lest we become misguided by the false signs of the enemy. We were cautioned about shifting our faith from God's greatest sign, Jesus, to that of earthly things. Our confidence was to rest primarily upon our good shepherd rather than on some method of determining God's will. Mrs. Penn Lewis cautions, if the believer ceases to use mind, reason, will, and all his other faculties as a person and depends upon voices and impulses for guidance in every detail of life, he will be led or guided by evil spirits feigning to be God. This is what's happening to Jonathan Clegg. Supernatural visions and manifestations are a fruitful source of revenue to deceiving spirits, especially when the believer relies upon and quotes more from these experiences than the word of God, for the aim of the wicked spirit is to displace the word of God as the rock ground of the life. Because we have been born again, we must not assume that we are thereby automatically protected from the power of evil spirits, nor are we necessarily delivered from them. A.J. Macmillan writes, By believing lies of the enemy, doctrines of devils, the mind becomes blinded and the will becomes increasingly under the control of the unseen forces. Until the personality is quite swayed by them, they will, the will becomes so influenced by false conceptions injected into the mind that it cannot respond to the, rep the presentation of the truth. Uh, this is pretty much everyone that believes in the alien deception. There has been, in some manner, a surrender of the will, which is not realized by the victim. The objection is frequently made that a true child of God cannot be brought thus under the control of the enemy. Experience disproves this, for even spiritual believers and earnest successful workers have suffered, some of them never coming to the place of complete deliverance. We as Christians have many precious promises, which are ours potentially, but which have not yet been possessed. As a matter of fact, the children of Israel were given the land of promise by Devon Fiat while they were yet in the wilderness. They then had to act upon God's word. So we also have wonderful provisions from God, not yet fully appreciated or appropriated, and therefore not yet actually experienced. In God's dealings with Israel, the land was theirs entirely, but it was under the control of trespassers and wrongful occupants who squatted on the land. Giants in the land had to be vanquished. This is uh, angel-human hybrids. And this was done by the spiritual power given as they acted in faith. In like manner, the territory held by the demons in a person's life must be wrested from the control of these wrongly occupying it. The demons are inside the person. Sometimes legal action is necessary to break their hold, such as the renunciation of sin, curses, past alliances, and transactions by which they are allowed access, penetration, and tenancy or possession. Past alliances, taking those oaths, those satanic oaths. A.J. McMillan believes that upon pastors and evangelists, the greatest measure of responsibility for the instruction of the flock of God is a special way. It is in a special way there is to discern the signs of the enemy working and to deliver their people. It is theirs also to teach and to warn of the perils which threaten the spiritually minded. There is no way to avoid dealing with demons. If one attempts to ignore them, they will not go away. They will intensify their activities. The more completely you are involved with following the Lord Jesus, the more you will encounter these beings as spiritual opponents. As you become more knowledgeable about their workings, they will become more apparent in their defiance of you. And the scope of your victory in Christ will be enlarged over the enemy. I speak, of course, of outward opposition chiefly. At the same time, the spirits assigned to hinder you covertly will become more devious, seeking to catch you off guard and unawares. 
That is why we need to maintain a day-by-day, hour-by-hour walk with the Lord in the light of His Word. There must be a total commitment of oneself to Christ. Memorizing and meditating on the Scriptures is an effective way to put up barriers against the inroads of the enemy. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And this is a faith walk all the way. And whosoever breaketh a hedge, a serpent shall bite them. Into the makeup of every individual, I am convinced that God has built a defense against the unseen world. It acts as a sort of fence or hedge around our minds, bodies, and spirits to keep us from perceiving or seeing that which exists in the spiritual dimension. This is holy for our good because the unprotected person peeking into the spirit realm can be seriously damaged by such contact. There seems to be several ways in which this protective fence can be lowered or breached by Satan's demon spirits. As Derek Prince so aptly states, the devil is no gentleman. He slips in on the slightest pretext, must be kicked out in the name of Jesus. Dr. Maxwell White, one of the pioneers in the battle of modern day deliverance, states flatly that any person who has ever gotten mixed up in drugs, alcohol, or immoral sex is definitely demonized and there is no doubt about the need for deliverance in such cases what is immoral what is it what is this immoral sex immoral sex is any type of sexual activity outside of marriage it doesn't matter if your boyfriend and girlfriend and you're doing it if you're not married it's immoral men with men women with women that's immoral the only moral sex there is is between a man and a woman in marriage. Everything else is immoral. And if you do it, you, you're getting demons in you. If you drink so much alcohol, you get drunk, you're getting demons in you. If you're doing these drugs, getting high, you're getting demons in you. And you do have them. The only way to get rid of them is to repent, turn to Jesus, get those demons kicked out of you in Jesus' name. And there is no doubt about the needs for deliverance in such cases. Peterson lists three forms of sin which constitute an invitation to the demon to have possession. Idolatry is first. For idolatry is a sin of rebellion against the revealed way of worshiping God. There shall no strange God be in thee, neither shall thou worship any strange God. Possession often takes place just when the idolater is consorting with sorcerers. A second ground for demon possession is a sin of fornication and adultery. No other sins have caused so much grief to the human race as these. In one case, it was a violent temper outburst which brought on the bout with the demons. Drunkenness and drug addiction also opened the door for the entrance of demons. Idolatry may not be suited for deceiving the so-called enlightened, people who regard it as humbug and superstition. Satan's deception becomes more subtle as he deals with the educated religious heathen. There is no department of a person's being that demons are incapable of affecting if they have the opportunity, whether physical, mental, emotional, or psychological. It may be seen in the New Testament how pronounced the effects of evil spirits were in imposing sickness and bodily disabilities of a great variety upon the victims. What we have learned from experience in dealing with demons, Mr. Penn Lewis has summed up well. They, demons, bury themselves in the very structure of the human frame, some acting directly upon the organs or appetites of the body, others upon the mind or intellect, sensibilities, emotions, and affections, and more immediately upon the spirit. They especially locate themselves in the sp spinal column, nervous system, and deepest nerve centers through which they control the whole being. From the ganglionic nerve center located in the bowels, the emotional sensibilities in all organs affected by them, to the cerebral nerve center in the head, the eyes, ears, neck, jaws, tongue, muscles of the face, and delicate nerve tissues of the brain. This explains why in many cases of deliverance we have seen eyes and ears improve to a marked degree, many pains of various sorts and intensities ceased, and emotional problems eased. In dealing with drug addicts particularly, there is necessity to ferret out the spirits that have hidden themselves in the bone marrow and thus affect the bloodstream adversely. There are also spirits that come in with drugs which attack the reproductive area and unless checked will sometimes work to produce offspring who are deformed and or 
disabled. In the case of sexual sin, it is always wise to check spirits of venereal disease, even though the person may never have manifested any signs of the disease. If a person dabbles with psychic phenomena, spiritism, seance, levitation, necromancy, fortune telling of any kind, horoscopes and astrology, Ouija boards, witchcraft, whether black or white, yellow, blue, green, gray, whatever, doesn't matter the color, sorcery, fetishes, charms, eastern religions, Zen Buddhism, transcendental meditation, including Hinduism, karate, yoga, um, I Ching, reincarnation, ESP, telepathy, hypnosis, the writings of mystics and psychics such as Gene Dixon, Edgar Casey, and others, he can expect to be invaded by these spirits. Yep, because you're given legal foothold and you're given and you're given legal ground for the demons to come into your body when you mess with those things. As his defenses are dropped by the meddling curiosity, occult spirits can and will enter in and establish themselves. These are the spirits which travel to the third and fourth generations through the parents. Inheritance. Because consorting with them breaks the first commandment by contacting other gods. A curse from God results. In the beginning, the experimenter with psychic phenomena can control when and to what degree he becomes involved with occult spirits. However, as he continues on, lured deeper into the mysteries of the spirit world by cle clever devils, his God-given defenses are forced down again and again. Increasingly, the demons have free access and control. Before long, they will exercise their capricious whims upon the unwitting victim and make a slave victim of him, driving him even deeper into the mire of sin and slavery. They will force him down every path that will cause him to open up to ever-increasing spiritual depravity. They may be able systematically to destroy his self-respect, destroy his personal and family life, and afflict him with many hurtful and destructive desires and hungers. In time, spirits of infirmity and sickness will also be brought to attack him to further weaken him. Demons are not satisfied with mere compliance to their wishes. They work to reduce their victim to a helpless state, filled with mental and physical anguish, almost beyond man's ability to endure. According to Mrs. Penn Lewis, the suffering caused by evil spirits can be spiritual, by causing acute suffering in the spirit, injecting feelings. This is why you can't go off your emotions, people. You have to go off Jesus Christ. You, got, you have to go off the word of God. You can't go off your emotions. You can't go off your feelings. Because demons can just make you feel these things. Uh, repugnant or poignant. Uh, soulish. By acute darkness, confusion, chaos, horror in the mind, anguish, knife-like pain in the heart or other innermost vital parts of the being, or physical in any part of the body. Frost warns, one subtle form of soulish behavior is a pseudo-spiritual emphasis that can lead to unwholesome mysticism. There is usually a great emphasis upon new revelations and spiritual mysteries often accomplished by visions, dreams, and prophetic discourses. All such manifestations must be tested by God's word and discerning spirit. A further and very practical proof of validity is the fruit produced. You will know them by their fruits. So-called spiritual leaders have been seduced into spiritism by approaching the occult from an intellectual but soulish point of view to investigate out of curiosity even borderline areas of parapsychology apart from the spiritual defenses is to invite deception and delusion into one's life. It has happened. That's why you don't want to mess with this stuff. Please don't mess with it. Dr. Junger states that Facts are not lacking to indicate that modern spiritism is nothing more or less than ancient sorcery revived. And when you do it, you're inviting evil spirits to invade your body. With particular emphasis on communicating with the supposed spirits of the dead. And there's no such thing as dead spirits or all devils and demons. No such thing as ghosts or all demons and devils which are really deceiving impersonating demons so that the phenomena is basically demonism you're not talking to dead people folks you're talking to demons please don't do it anymore stop Jacob adds when people who are theologically ignorant begin to dabble in matters of the spirit anything can happen when starved men finally eat they may not be able to go about it with cool heads or ready stomachs as for the spiritualist church, which is popping up everywhere nowadays, on page 70 of their manual, they say bully. It is the mission of the spiritualists to revolutionize the world. 
to sweep away the cumul accumulated rubbish of centuries of ignorance and superstition. What is this rubbish accumulated over the centuries? Listen to Mrs. M. E. Cad while they're editor of the Progressive Thinker, one of the journals of spiritualism. I denounce the following. The vicarious atonement, the doctrine of eternal punishment, the literal resurrection of the body, the virgin birth of Jesus, the infallibility of the Bible, the doctrine of salvation by faith only. No, the religion of the spiritualist is different from the so-called Christian religion as a sunny day is from a starless night. And uh, I don't know if this woman is still alive, but uh, Lord, I, if uh, she's alive, please have mercy on her. And I ask that you bless them in Jesus' name. Because she just cursed herself by saying that. Willful sin is another open door to the entrance of demonic control. And one willful sin always invites others along with it because sin is progressive. When lust is, when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin bringeth forth death. And death is a second death, which is burning forever and ever in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the smoke of your torment will ascend forever and ever. Because sin is progressive, one act of disobedience leads to another. A demon may be secretly welcomed by a prospective host for some selfish reason, therefore move in, or it may move into the host as an unwelcome intruder. The host, in either case, must deal with the demon's presence. Once they have a position in a host, they may invite fellow demons in or may become overly demanding and can cause great trouble. This can lead to the domination of the host's personality, either all or part of the time. Any habit or desire which has gotten to the point of driving, compelling, and tormenting the person is suspect, for this is the way the demon operates. Robert Patterson, missionary to Indonesia, lists a number of the grosser symptoms and manifestations where demons have gained a degree of control. Enlarged eyes and glassy stare. I see this all the time on TV. No, I don't watch TV. I will just, uh, I might look at the TV for maybe like a minute, but I don't watch TV. <clears throat> but if you would notice when you, uh, um, you can notice this m more on news shows. This is where I notice it more because um, uh, they will start blinking like crazy. Like uh, they will blink like hundreds of times a minute, which is not normal. And uh, they're definitely demonized. But the eyes really are the window to the soul. So enlarged eyes and, glassy, and a glassy stare. Fear and intense hatred in the eyes and expression. Flatulence and heavy labored breathing. A voice apparently not originating from the vocal cords, frequently using a language unknown to the possessed. Abnormal passions seen in such things as the use of vile epithets, drunkenness, drugs, and sexual vices. Frequent suicidal impulses. The, the possessed advances toward one with a wild countenance and often threatening gestures calculated to inspire fear and when rebuffed there is a violent display of temper. The demons are able to impart supernatural strength with remote acts of violence. As mentioned above, drugs and alcohol depress and weaken God's protective devices for man. Most of the time alcohol works more slowly but just as surely toward the same end as drugs. Delirium treatments in alcoholic is nothing more than seeing into the spirit world. What he sees there with a naked, unprotected mind and soul is, is enough nearly to drive him out of his mind with terror. What alcohol does gradually over a period of time, drugs can accomplish in a matter of minutes, depending on the kind used. The psychedelic hallucinogenic drugs will lower the screen of protection, allowing demonic forces access to a person and causing him to see whatever the demons wish him to experience. They frequently bait the poor deluded victim with good trips that reveal whole worlds of blinding color, sounds, and strange scenes of breathtaking beauty. Since these are fascinating to the depraved nature of man, the individual submits again and again. The victim may even have visions of God, angels, and heaven, deceiving and misleading. 
It will not be long, however, before the demons tire of this sport and begin to show their cruel and destructive nature. As they drop their mass of beauty and euphoria, the dupe is subjected to ugliness laced with horror or unbridled terror. This is intended to drive him toward insanity and or suicide. The Bible says about alcohol, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. The same is true of drugs. The difference is that with drugs, it's almost instant insanity. With alcohol, the process usually takes longer, kind of creeping, sure deterioration. The end is the same. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. I recall a young Navy lad in his 20s who came to my home one night to get help for himself and his wife. He was taking drugs, mostly grass and acid. A few months earlier while tripping he, on acid, he had experienced a fantastically beautiful experience. It had begun in horror with an angelic guide escorting him to see the pits of hell. Next, he was taken to a realm where he saw heaven and met God. The God he met was an exceedingly dazzling creature who informed him in dulcet to tones that all the young man had to do was put his trust in him and all would be well. He would not go to hell, but rather come to this beautiful place, aglow with beauty and light. He was to go forth to enlist others to come here too. And, uh, you know, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, it says, No wonder Satan himself transforms into an angel of light and uh, you know the false prophets transform themselves into ministers of righteousness I think that's uh, verse 15 or 16 this was his conversion experience and his call to preach as he told me the reason he had come for help was that in spite of these lovely experiences which were repeated each time he tripped on drugs he was deeply troubled, restless and unhappy unless on drugs. He could neither pray nor have any sort of communication with God when he was straight. A growing sense of une uneasiness, a gnawing emptiness, a total absence of peace, and a burning desire to return to drugs were all that he had to show from his experience. Somehow he knew this was wrong, and it caused him to seek help. My first task was to lead, lead him to see that he had never been born again at all and had no evidence of Bible salvation. He was a victim of a real but counterfeit religious experience, of conversion totally foreign to scriptures. I read Revelation 3.20 to him. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. I explained that he must personally and definitely invite Jesus Christ to come into his heart and save him from his sin. After a bit of patient reviewing of the verses, the Holy Spirit enlightened his understanding. The blindness fell from his, eye, from his mind. And he grasped the simple truth of the gospel. It began to dawn on him that he had been defrauded by cunning, deceiving religious spirits into accepting a pseudo-conversion experience. After being convinced of the truth of the scripture, he attempted to, to ask Jesus Christ to come into his heart. This caused unbelievable distress and difficulty. He could hardly talk, but gasped out words, haltingly and with long, drawn-out syllables, as the demons had captured him through drugs, fought to prevent his acceptance of the Savior. I had to rebuke and bind the hindering spirits in Jesus' name before he finally got the words out. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save me from my sins right now. Yes, please. If you're, if you're watching this video and you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, just say, Lord Jesus, please come into my life. That's all you have to, that's all you have to say. Say it out loud. Believe it. Believe it. And then after you say it, say, Lord Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit. If you don't know Jesus, please say, Lord Jesus, please come into my life and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Please, if you haven't, if you haven't, if you haven't done that, please say it out loud from your heart and believe it and you will receive it. When he did this, great peace filled his soul. His burden lifted and his awful fears of the future vanished. After making sure that he had the assurance that Jesus had come into his heart, I turned to his wife, who was trembling uncontrollably. She, too, was eager to be saved and quickly asked Jesus to come into her heart. They began to embrace, laughing and crying with relief and great joy, praising the Lord Jesus, from whom the deep, settled peace had come upon their troubled souls. I had the joy of casting out demons from each of them that night. Some hours later, they left, rejoicing all that Jesus Christ had done for them. Some individuals are so bound that they may have almost lost their will to the power of the enemy. 
God can set them free by the prayer of faith and the authority of, of Jesus' name. Such a release, however, can be maintained only if they choose to remain free. If we are willing to be dominated, we can be dominated. But if we want to enjoy the reality of, of that which is ours, we can. James wrote, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. James chapter 4, verse 7. And before you resist the devil, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Because if you try to res resist the devil on your own, it's not going to work. You need to submit to God first. Submit to the Lord Jesus Christ first. And then through Jesus, it will be able to resist that devil. And then he will have to run away from you. James 4.7 has the order right. First we must submit to God. Then we resist the devil. This fierce enemy cannot stand before us then. Frost writes that the demons hate and fear believers. They know that they are defeated, but this does not stop them from continuing their work until their defeat is enforced upon them by faithful believers. Although ministers and workers are often able to help others, God wants his children to grow up in him and in the knowledge of his word and be able to experience authority over Satan. This is the authority of the believer, not just of the preachers and special workers. We are assured that there can be some weakening of demon powers by refusing to give them the cooperation they thrive upon. They feed on our fears and self-directed thoughts. Fear hath torment. Our power to resist and overcome increases as we feed upon God's truth and give attention to His Son by much praise and worship. And let me tell you something right now. Every time you rebuke the devil and all of his demons in Jesus' name, it's like you're bombing them. And every time you praise and worship the Lord, it's like you're, uh, you know, it's like you're shelling them with artillery. Our faith becomes strong by praying in the Spirit, in truth. Because God is Spirit. So those that worship and praise God do so in Spirit and in truth. The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So that's the end. Um, I will put the um, link of where to download it so you can read along and read it on your own. And I hope this video is a blessing to you and God bless you.